Good morning, everyone. I am Lee Ellis, Vice Chair for Translational Medicine at SWAG. Along with James Ray, Executive Officer for Translational Medicine, we'd like to welcome you to the Plenary One session at our semi-annual meeting. This session will focus on translational medicine and importantly, collaborative opportunities. I will begin the session with a short introduction and announcements. This will be followed by a talk by David Tuvison, the Roy J. Zuckerberg Professor of Cancer Research and Cancer Center Director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. I will also note that David just assumed the presidency of the AACR. Of note, the prior president was Tony Rebos, and it is wonderful to see SWAG leaders also play a leadership role in the world of cancer research in general. Congratulations, David, on assuming the presidency of the AACR, and we thank Tony for your role as past president. Our second speaker will be Ed Liu. Ed is president and CEO of the Jackson Laboratory and has had a remarkable career focused on the genomics of cancer. As you can see, we have an outstanding program today, and therefore I will keep my introductory comments short. These are the presenter's disclosures. I do have a few announcements to make, especially regarding opportunities from the Hope Foundation and the NCI. All of these slides will be posted to the meeting website, so there is no need to take notes or pictures. There are great opportunities, but some of these deadlines are rapidly approaching, so I encourage you to go to the website in the very near future. Listed on the slide are the multiple opportunities for funding and programs from the HOPE Foundation. We are grateful for their support of so many SWAG activities, including education, grant support, CTP, and many other critical SWAG programs. I urge everyone to stop by their virtual exhibit during the SWAG virtual meeting. The following slides regarding the NCI funding opportunity are available on the SWAG meeting website. The following slides were provided by the NCI. There is an RFA that has just been released by the NCI in regards to funding for integrated studies in our clinical trials. Up to $500,000 will be provided for a single year. The letter of intent is due relatively soon, May 28th, and that is quickly followed by the application deadline. Each each NCTN group can submit up to three applications, and each NCOR group can submit up to two applications. Please be sure to notify the chairs of these groups ahead of your submission of your letter of intent. Hypothesis testing studies, not hypothesis generating studies, should be proposed from specimens from randomized phase two or phase three trials where accrual has reached 75% or more. Here are more details, and as mentioned, the slides are posted to the SWAG meeting website. I will now turn the program over to Dr. Tuvison. Following Dr. Tuvison's talk, we will immediately proceed to Dr. Liu's talk. Then we will have time for selected questions from the chat box and live answers from our speakers. Thank you for attending today's session, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Tuvison, the Cancer Center Director at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Together with Ed Liu of the Jackson Laboratory, we are your Basic Science Cancer Center partners at SWAG. We've been uh, honored to have this uh, partnership over the last half dozen to 10 years. And I'm going to talk to you today about a project which I initiated some time ago with SWAG member Edward Kim and uh, current SWAG member Irvi Tyriak. It's entitled Pancreatic Cancer Organoids as a Predictive Model for Chemotherapy, a co-clinical trial. This is my disclosure slide, which will not be pertinent uh, for this presentation today. Pancreatic cancer, as you're well aware, is a very difficult to treat cancer. Patients frequently do not survive 
uh, a year after diagnosis with the median survival um, uh, being just just over that time period. In fact, less than 10% of patients are alive five years after diagnosis. Most of those patients, of course, have gotten surgical resection of a primary tumor. For patients that present with metastatic pancreatic cancer, there are two systemic chemotherapy regimens, fulfirinox, shown on the left, and gemcitabinibraxane, shown on the right. When these uh, two regimens are compared to gemcitabine, uh, there is a several month increase in median survival uh, in both settings, in both of these uh, New England Journal of Medicine papers published over the last decade. Unfortunately, um, these regimens, although useful for many patients, are not durable, and the patients uh, re relapse or are taken off of treatment due to toxicity um, and uh, succumb. Frequently in pancreatic cancer, the patients are too sick to go on a second line uh, agent. And uh, this is something that certainly has been uh, very uh, frustrating and concerning for all of us who take care of pancreas cancer patients. So any way that would predict the best treatment for a patient going into it would be um, most welcome in this disease. One thing we've learned about this disease over the past uh, several years is that there are several classes of pancreatic cancer not determined by uh, marker gene mutations such as KRAS or P53, but rather based upon RNA gene expression. And the two subtypes, um, roughly speaking, that exist in pancreatic cancer are classical, also called progenitor, or basal, also called squamous, with the basal squamous having the worst prognosis. And so in this study on the left, the basal is in blue, um, this is by Eric Collison. The study in the middle by Jen Genye and Richard Moffat. The basal is in tan. And on the one on the right by Peter Bailey and Andrew Biancan, the basal is in blue. And the other lines um, are other subtypes, but classical is the, is, the, is the biggest other subtype. So these three studies are in patients that uh, were operated on for pancreatic cancer, where there is um, a possibility of long-term survival from this disease. Uh, but the, the existence of these subtypes is quite interesting. Um, and again, these studies were done some, some time ago, and so the patients were getting either nothing or gemcitabine or 5-FU as their treatment. It, it's really highlighted, though, based upon this uh, data from our Canadian colleagues in Toronto, Steve Gallinger, uh, Granio Kane, and Jennifer Knox, and Sandra Fisher in college. They've shown that in uh, patients with metastatic pancreas cancer, treated with fulfirinox on the left or treated with gemabraxane on the right, these are waterfall plots. The patients who do the worst, meaning their tumors are growing um, at uh, eight weeks, as shown on the left on this waterfall plot, the patients in tan, they're frequently enriched for uh, basal uh, patients. And uh, whereas on the right, the, the basal patients are equally distributed between um, progressive disease and stable disease or response. Um, and in purple here, obviously, are the um, classical patients. And this is shown really dramatically below in the in these uh, median overall survival curves. If you have, uh, if you're treated with fulfirinox and you're basal, you do terribly compared to classical. Whereas you can not distinguish between basal and classical when you give gemibraxane. Suggesting there's something prognostic or even predictive about the basal versus classical. So how do we, how do we like approach this problem as pancreas cancer uh, clinician scientists? Is there any way to predict the best therapy to offer a patient? So we decided some time ago to, to help derive these new um, tissue models of human pancreas cancer called organoids. We started a SWOG ITSC project, which was uh, co-funded uh, by our U10 grant with some support from the Hope Foundation, working with Ed Kim at UCLA, who helped us derive the first small biopsies um, of pancreas cancer that we could use to make this model. Irvay Tiriak, who is my um, main scientist who drove this project, is now at UCSD and works closely with Andy Lowy to develop their organoid facility there. And, you know, to cut to the chase, the, the, the project is really shown here. We um, get a biopsy or a surgical resection of the pancreas tumor grown organoid, which are these structures as shown here. Um, and then we sequence the, um, the genes at the level of DNA uh, and sequence gene expression, uh, meaning RNA test all of the organoids against the therapies um, that the patients may be exposed to, the five uh, chemotherapies as monotherapies, 
and combine that information, the pharmacological information with the molecular information to, to arrive in some systems biology approach of this. So RNA plus drug we call pharmacotranscriptomics, uh, DNA plus drug we call pharmacogenomics, and ask, is there anything that we can learn or ascertain about all those patients that we have made these organoids on? Testing again the five chemotherapeutics, uh, as well as a variety of investigational agents. Um, this was a small biopsy from a um, EUS FNA that Irve was able to generate on a patient. Here's what the sample looks like. This is a one and a half cc Eppendorf um, with red cells, and you can lyse with hypotonic saline. Uh, and this is this this small strip of uh, tissue which comes from the EUS needle. Within three days, you see these organoids which are growing in the semi-solid media, and here it is robustly growing after uh, several more days. And so Irve did a very large uh, pilot study to ask the feasibility of generating organoids from either resection specimens on the left, metastatic biopsies in the middle columns, autopsy specimens, or from normal pancreatic donors, uh, which were uh, folks who died from motorcycle accidents. He derived sort of a success score for developing organoids, which roughly was in the 75% range. Very quickly, he was able to show that uh, over 90% of the organoids had Kirsten RAS mutations, which, which is what we would expect. Those that lacked KRAS mutations had other oncogenic drivers. There was a variety of them that had P53 mutations, and a smaller subset had P16 or SMAD4 mutations, as well as some other tumor suppressor gene mutations. When he tried to cluster them based upon gene expression in the organoid, he got essentially um, various clusters in black. These are the, um, the normal pancreatic ductal organoids. And the, here's a variety of specimens obtained from either surgical resections, which would be stage one, two, or these more advanced, locally advanced pancreatic cancer or metastatic pancreas cancer. When he looked at gene expression, he could classify them um, also in not just a PCA plot, but in a non-hierarchical clustering as two different motifs, which were called C1 and C2, which um, were very similar to classical and basal, but not directly overlapping it. And, um, and it was able to then do the um, pharmacological perturbation that I had mentioned before, um, challenging each organoid with each of the five chemotherapeutics um, as, as single agents, developing IC50 uh, values as well as area under the curve, showing that this is a very reproducible assay um, in several samples. This is gemcitabine on the top, uh, paclitaxel on the bottom over various passages of that same organoid. And by deriving um, information from a large number of samples, Irby was able to show that there is tremendous dis uh, diversity in response to uh, just the monotherapeutic uh, agents in these chemotherapy cocktails across all, all of these many samples. And so some samples were very resistant to drugs, and this is shown in the red. Some were very sensitive, shown in the uh, blue, and then there was this intermediate class. And these are the five different chemotherapy drugs, again, just arranging them all in tertiles. And so we have this pharmacology data, we have the gene expression data. What happens if we put it all together? And so our collaborator, Alex Krasnitz, helped us do this. And uh, by doing so, we could um, uh, drive a, uh, a, a relationship between um, gene expression and, uh, and mutations um, that we could find in the DNA, as well as gene expression um, and uh, drug responses. And th this was actually uh, quite interesting to, to look for these, uh, these signatures because then we could ask, do we find these signatures in the organoids? And then do we find these signatures in other patient samples? And so if we look just in the organoids at these gene signatures, we could sort of cluster our organoids now based upon these pharmacological gene signatures, so pharmacotranscriptomics. In fact, we could cut our samples in half for sensitivity to gemcitabine. In this case, uh, more sensitive was uh, in the blue and less sensitive in the red. So, but the real test became the question of what would happen if we were to look in human specimens using our um, organoid-derived uh, signatures. And so this is a, a picture of a, of a pancreatic cancer which was resected from a patient. Um, and uh, the, the cancer cells are obviously here uh, inside the red dashed line, and the stroma is on the outside. Pancreas cancer is, uh, you know, a, a very unusual cancer in that majority of the of the space in the tumor is comprised of stroma, non neoplastical elements of extracellular matrix, fibroblast, immune cells, vasculature, etc. 
and, uh, and, and our collaborators at the University of Toronto had actually done studies where they laser captured the cancer cells from resection specimens or from needle biopsies of metastases. Um, and, and this was really critical for the uh, rest of this study. And so when we worked with uh, Steve Gallinger and his colleagues, um, we were able to ask in both the adjuvant setting of resected specimens and in the advanced setting, uh, patients with metastatic cancer that had needle biopsies, do our signatures of chemotherapy response matter? And so here is the first uh, tranche of that data. Um, we had a total of 65 uh, patients that had resections and Hervé applied his gemcitabine sensitivity signature to these specimens. And they are arranged um, uh, computationally on, on this slide, showing you essentially this, this grade between red on the left and blue on the right of this, of this large gene signature. When we looked at the gemcitabine a, a sensitivity signature in these 65 uh, patients, which is this panel on the left. If you had the signature, you're shown in this case in green. If you lack the signature, you're shown in blue. And this is um, disease-free survival. Uh, and so after resection, if you had the signature, your chance of, of being alive um, uh, five years later was quite, uh, uh, quite a bit more than if you lacked the signature. And so this, this was actually our first evidence that this may be a predictive signature for outcomes, but was a, pr a prognostic signature. Well, we had less patients to ask this on, but we did have a total of 30 patients that had not been treated. And um, we asked in the patients that had not been treated, if we separate them based on the signature, how do they look? And they look basically the same. There was no difference between the two, suggesting in this limited data set that it's a not prognostic uh, signature but it is predictive. Well, what about um, metastatic pancreas cancer? And so the Canadian, uh, our Canadian colleagues had done uh, this study, as I mentioned, uh, the COMPASS study to ask that question. And they had uh, patients either getting fulfirinox or gem abraxane um, on their studies. And they had 18 gauge core needle biopsies from liver metastases that had been laser capture microdissected and then followed by RNA sequencing uh, by uh, Sandra Fisher, extremely talented pathologist at the University of Toronto, working with Jennifer Knox and Steve Gallinger and Grania O'Kane. And in this cohort, we had more data from the Fulfirinox treated patients that, that's just more commonly used to treat the patients. And we had an oxaliplatin chemosensitivity signature from the organoids. When we applied that to these patients, the oxaliplatin signature if you have it, this, in this case, you're in blue. If you lack it, you're in red. And so um, this is a waterfall plot. And the patients who are progressing after eight weeks are shown on the right-hand side in this case. And there's a lot more red on the right. And there's a lot more blue on the left. And so the patients that had the signature in blue on the left, lack, who lacked the signature, mostly were red on the right. And so again, this was quite suggestive that, that the signatures may be onto something. And this led to our first uh, publication on this topic, which came out uh, in 2018, about uh, three years ago now. Um, and Edward Kim, um, who was part of our SWOG ITSC study, where again, we derived those first needle biopsies, those first EUS FNA, just to show feasibility that we can make organoids from, from EUS as a co-author on this paper. Of course, have led us over uh, the years after it to push for a trial where we can test whether our signatures are correct or not. Um, and so this is the trial, which Jennifer Knox at the University of Toronto, Princess Margaret Hospital, and Elizabeth Jaffe at Johns Hopkins Hospital are the co-PIs on. It includes uh, several sites in Canada and four sites in the U.S. In the U.S., it's Hopkins, uh, Dana-Farber, and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and uh, Northwell Health. And the trial is a randomized trial between uh, Fulfirinox and Gemabraxane. This is a trial that's never been done by a cooperative group or by... Um, any socialized health system uh, to the best of our knowledge. And so it's a 150 patient trial that will be randomized between the two arms. Um, to enroll in this study, you have to have accessible disease for 18 gauge needle biopsies, which will be used for diagnosis, for laser capture microdissection of RNA and DNA, and for organoid generation, as well as a variety of other uh, translational uh, goals. Uh, with the um, point of the organoids being we want, this is a co-clinical trial. The patients are already gonna get one of the two chemotherapies. We're going to predict based on our organoid empiric drug testing 
and our chemotherapy sensitivity signatures, how the patient's going to do. And so then when the trial is halfway through and all the way through, we will unblind and ask were our organoids in fact predictive or not of how the patients have done. And to do this properly at Cold Spring Harbor, which as you all know, is a basic science cancer center, we've established a human organoid facility at our Woodbury campus, where um, this space has been uh, separated into an R&D space, research and development space, and a clinical space, where we actually already have a New York State CLEP designation for any test that uh, is CLEP certified. And so the SOPs for developing uh, this approach uh, have been have been derived and have been devised so they can be conducted in a space. And uh, we have all the specialized equipment. We've hired a new staff of people to do the study and uh, they have optimized all of, all of the approaches uh, that Hervé initially uh, got us on. And in fact, if this, if this uh, PASS-1 trial is positive in the co-clinical setting, we plan to apply for a laboratory developed test in New York State if PASS-1 is positive such that we could then uh, propose a prospective trial of using the organoid data up front to choose therapy for a patient. Well, I mean, obviously chemotherapy is, is a starting point in pancreas cancer, but it's not going to be the end point. We're going to need to find uh, targeted therapies for our patients, immune therapies, metabolic therapies, all, all sorts of other things. One interesting thing about the um, organoid-based approach is it allows us to really concentrate on those organoids, which are innately chemotherapy refractory. And about 20% of them are, meaning they're not sensitive to fulfirinox or gemabraxane in our hands in vitro. And when you look in vivo, you see about the same. About 20% are just non-responsive. Well, um, er, uh, Dennis Planker, who's uh, really been uh, really picked up the reins from Hervé, has been conducting this study. And Dennis has found uh, in multiple cases, when you have these chemo refractory organoids, you can find targeted therapies such as this MEK inhibitor, which is which can be exquisitely uh, potent in some of these uh, cultures. And so as part of our, our studies right now, in addition to the chemotherapies we are assessing, Dennis is looking at another 100 or so uh, investigational agents. And uh, so in summary, uh, patient-derived organoids for pancreas cancer can be used to predict treatment response, certainly in preclinical settings. It's feasible to grow organoids um, for clinical drug, drug screens of over 100 compounds. Um, the fastest dentist can grow an organoid and begin a test is uh, in the two-week range. I'd say most of the time we're working on the month range. We would like to get this test down to one-week range. If we can do that, then I think we, we really uh, could provide potentially a lot of benefit. And this co-clinical trial we're doing right now, PASS-1, will determine the predictive utility, we think, for PDOs in PDAC, at least at the level of co-clinical. And then a prospective trial would have to be determined in a randomized setting if it, if it provides benefit. And so Dennis is, is shown here in the middle. He has uh, two colleagues, Hardik Patel, who's his senior scientist, and Luce uh, St. Uh, Surin, um, who's his research technologist. And they've been doing a really terrific job. And um, and so this is Hervé, and this is Dennis, this is Hans, who showed us how to make the organoids in the first place with this fish. And this past one trial is sponsored by the Les Garden Foundation, by Stand Up to Cancer, uh, as well as by Pancreatic Cancer Canada. And uh, it's really a, a terrific um, collaboration internationally uh, to uh, tackle this disease. And again, this idea we started working on with uh, colleagues here at SWOG, and we would really like to keep including you in this as we uh, attempt to determine whether this is a new way to help our patients. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Ed Liu, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about how the a whole genome configuration of a cancer can actually give you um, an idea of how that cancer will respond to therapy. Uh, in short, it's about genome scale of bar markers for multi-cancer indications. Uh, the genome scale biomarker I'm talking about is one that we had described called tandem duplicator phenotype. Um, and this is, re, uh, uh, in effect, a um, uh, many uh, single tandem duplications, as is seen in the bottom here, where a segment of DNA within the genome is duplicated in a head-to-tail head -to manner. 
Um, it's characterized by a specific span size, that is the size of that segment being, uh, being duplicated. But the tandem duplicator phenotype um, uh, is a configuration where many of these tandem duplications from tens to hundreds of them are distributed in an equivalent fashion, a distributed fashion all throughout the genome. Um, what we have found is that there are different types that are linked to the span size. Uh, and the type one, which is the span of the segmented uh, duplication, is 10 kilobases long, is tightly linked to loss of BRCA1 activity, whether it is a structural mutation uh, or uh, methylation of the promoter, which causes silencing of expression. A type one or uh, group one TDP is found in about 35% of triple negative breast cancers and 30% of ovarian cancers. And, and many of these tandem duplications either <clears throat> disrupt uh, tumor suppressor genes or amplify um, um, super enhancers for oncogenes. Um, it, we found that, <clears throat> that there needed to be an absolute um, concordant loss of P53 um, mutations on a statistical basis, but we went into animal models and showed that um, the conjoint loss of P53 and BRCA1 induces exactly the same genomic scar of um, group one TDP. Um, the more clinically relevant portion uh, of this observation is that um, we had preliminary data in cell lines and in patient-derived xenografts that these um, TNBC PDXs are more sensitive to cisplatinum uh, if they are uh, TDP group one. Um, so going into this talk, our focus, our hypothesis is that TDP is a biomarker of sensitivity to platinum-based therapy in TNBC and ovarian cancer. Now, this concept is not terribly new. In fact, using HRD or homologous recombination deficiency as a measure of, um, of defects uh, across the BRCA series, including promoter methylation and mutations, it was found that in some reports uh, it's associated with better outcome, in others not, and in and yet others it's, um, it's, it's neutral in terms of its finding. So we went and sought to refine this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, observation in a more systematic and genomic fashion. Uh, first thing we did was to um, partner with City of Hope colleagues, George Somlo and Yuan Yuan, um, where they had a um, treatment naive cohort of 42 triple negative breast cancer patients undergoing neoadjuvant carboplatinum and paclitaxel therapy. Um, and we asked a specific question is does TDP uh, predict for chemosensitivity. And when we looked at that, first thing we had confirmed is that the BRCA1 abrogation, uh, whether it's promoter methylation or mutation, is tightly linked, um, uh, dramatically linked to the, the genome scar of type 1 TDP. But when we looked at the response as measured by pathological CR in this series, we found no association with TDP and outcome. However, when we fractionated the, um, the cohort out to BRCA1 mutation versus methylation, we found a distinct difference that when we added the two cases of BRCA2 that had path CRs as well, we found that it was now even in this small series statistically significant. Now, um, clinical associations, especially with small uh, cohorts, can be imprecise um, and unstable. So we asked in a, um, in a more controlled setting whether or not the BRCA1-2 mutant state, but not the promoter methylated state, specifically predicts for platinum sensitivity. And this controlled setting is in PDX models. Um, this is done in conjunction with Mike Lewis at Baylor College of Medicine looking at 33 PDX models of triple negative breast cancers that were treated with single agent platinum or docetaxel. And what we found was that yet again, type one TDP was not statistically associated with response, 
but BRCA1-2 mutation and not methylation was statistically associated, even in the small group, with, um, uh, with, with, um, with a good response in the PDX models, but only to carboplatinum and not to docetaxel, which suggests that there is, there is chemotherapeutic sensitivity um, to a genotoxic agent like carboplatinum in the BRCA1-2 mutant, but not the methylated state. We even went further to, uh, to a more precise model, and this is a, some, uh, this is a triple negative breast cancer model uh, from Chris Lord at ICRF, where it was mutant P53 and a mutant BRCA1, but then he reverted the mutation into wild type BRCA1. And so in these paired isogenically, um, uh, isogenic cell lines that are paired with only a single variant uh, that is in the mutation of BRCA1, we found that uh, there was specific sensitivity to, uh, to cis platinum about 2.4 times more sensitive to platinum in the BRCA1 deficient versus the BRCA1 wild type that was not seen in docetaxel. So all along the way, what we find is that it is um, that there is sensitivity to uh, BRCA1 loss, particularly in the mutation, but it's restricted to uh, cisplatinum or some genotoxic DNA damaging agent as opposed to docetaxel. Now, um, the, the goal of a pan-cancer biomarker is to state that regardless of the tissue of origin, the molecular mutation may be the guiding force. Uh, and we ask the question, uh, because ovarian cancers have exactly the same scar associated with BRCA1, um, and there was already signals that in ovarian cancer, BRCA deficiency is associated with um, better outcome to chemotherapy. So we looked at um, various cohorts that have been both published and that we have worked um, with individual groups on. And the first was uh, the published ovarian cancer study from Australia, uh, where there was whole genome uh, sequence data and response data. And yet again, what we found was that it was BRCA1-2 mutant tumors that had the response, a good response to uh, platinum-based chemotherapy and not BRCA1 methylation. And when we looked at overall survival, we found that in TDP itself, which is a panel on the right, was not statistically associated with a good outcome as compared to BRCA1-2 mutant status um, versus the methylated status, as you see in the middle panel here. Um, we then uh, worked with uh, doctors uh, Schwischer and Banda in University of Washington, who provided us 63 um, samples that were previously characterized uh, um, uh, both clinically and in terms of the uh, BRCA status. Uh, and we did whole genome sequencing uh, and then reconfirmed that it was a BRCA1-2 mutant subgroup that was associated with good outcome. And one can see that not, not only that uh, the, that the uh, overall survival was improved with even a hint of a plateauing of the survival curve, but that it was um, consistently concentrated on those with optimum debulking. We found that optimum debulking was a, an independent uh, predictor of outcome. Uh, and when we looked at only the individuals with optimum debulking, that was where the major uh, advantage of bringing BRCA1 to mutant uh, uh, was seen. Um, uh, because these numbers were relatively small, we went and looked at the T TCGA ovarian cancer cohort, which is a little messier, but at least gave us higher numbers. And, and we found again that BRCA1-2 mutant um, tumors had a, an improved, statistically improved survival that showed a, uh, a plateau in the survival curve compared to wild type or BRCA1 methylated uh, tumors. And again, it was concentrated on the, those individuals with optimum debulking um, in this cohort. Now, um, this whole issue of promoter methylation was a big puzzle for us because we had found previously that, um, that the signatures for, uh, for promoter methylated, um, BRCA promoter methylated tumors versus mutant tumors were absolutely identical uh, in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. 
But why is it that the promoter methylation did not have the same sensitivity despite the very similar biochemistry and, and biology? Well, you know, we found that in the literature, there was this one um, meta-analysis in, in nearly 8,000 ovarian cancer cases that actually saw exactly the same, that BRCA1-2 mutation and low BRCA1 uh, RNA levels were associated with better outcome in overall survival, but not at all a promoter methylation. There is something fundamental about this observation. We looked at it again more carefully in our contemporary cohorts and found that, um, that BRCA1 methylation had the lowest amount of BRCA expression. Um, in this case, anywhere between eight and 16 fold lower than in wild type itself. And furthermore, their genomic scars, whether or not the, the size of the TDP or the TDP score itself was identical between the methylated and the mutant um, the tumors. So there was nothing different at the origins of these cancers um, for BRCA1 methylated and BRCA1 mutant. But we, looking at the methylation profile, particularly at PDXs, and using PDX was a critical piece to this observation, we found something interesting. When we do uh, MSP analysis of, of promoter methylation in clinical samples, when we see a, um, an, uh, an unmethylated band, we, uh, we either attributed it to a part of the tumor or that there's a normal stroma that it's actually intermixed and we can't discern the two. But in PDX models, the only stroma is mouse stroma and whatever signal you, we see for the unmethylated bands um, is really from the, the uh, human tumor itself. But we saw that in individuals whose PDX, who gave a PDX a tumor, but that individual was patient, uh, was treatment naive, we found that there was only a methylated band in those people with um, promoter methylation, but not an unmethylated band. And in uh, individuals with wild type BRCA1 uh, and treatment naive, there's only unmethylated uh, and not a methylated band, as you would expect. But an individual who uh, started out with promoter methylation, but was now post-treatment with, ke with chemotherapy, there was an emergence of an unmethylated band. We then looked at our entire panel of PDX models um, where we had um, the, the clinical data from, from the patients, um, uh, of the patients from which these tumors were derived. And we found a perfect concordance between whether or not they were treatment naive or post-treatment in that the treatment naive individuals were fully methylated, whereas the ones who experienced um, treatment and then gave the, P, uh, gave the tissues for PDX in, uh, uh, implantation uh, had the presence of an unmethylated band and therefore were partially methylated. Um, we then actually went into PDX models and looked at a fully methylated tumor, treated them with three, psych three weekly doses of platinum and allowed them to uh, re recur in their tumors. And we found that, that when untreated, there was primarily a methylated band, but upon treatment with only this very short treatment, there was um, uh, the emergence of an unmethylated band suggesting that um, that just this short treatment was a, had the ability to demethylate uh, a fully methylated uh, by, uh, uh, fully methylated um, BRCA1 promoter allele. When we looked at the RNA expression along these different um, PDX models, we find of course after platinum treatment there is induction of BRCA1 but there was a huge range of induction in um, BRCA1 methylated tumors from uh, a small amount to a very significant amount to even amounts that are higher than seen in wild type in an individual that was partially methylated. And furthermore, that this partial methylation uh, in this partially methylated PDX models that even treatment with single agent docetaxel induced BRCA1 expression. Now, um, this suggested that BRCA1 methylated tumors are highly adapted to, uh, to chemotherapeutic agents and that by elevating the, um, 
the expression of BRCA1 to near wild type levels that was sufficient to abrogate any advantage that BRCA deficiency would give to that individual. Now, we next turn our attention to the BRCA1 to wild type tumors, which as a group performed uh, poorly, even though that in the TMBC um, cohort from City of Hope, there were individuals with BRCA1 to wild type tumors to achieve pathological CR. We then looked at, um, first of all, the mutation status, and there was no difference between triple negative breast cancer cases who had um, path CR versus those who did not. But when we looked at the RNA, it was very distinctive. Um, and the major um, difference was the uh, upregulation of immune uh, genes, uh, as you see here with, with a p-value that is really off the scale. When we looked at it more carefully, the, 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 the differential uh, gene expression uh, was uh, focalized only to BRCA1 to wild type tumors and not to BRCA1 um, methylated tumors and certainly not to um, BRCA1 mutant tumors. Now, let me just say that this is actually separating out those individuals who had past CR versus those who did not in each of these subtypes. Um, um, we, we then looked at a different form of, of configuration, and this is the Vanderbilt assignment of, of expression profiles. And they had defined an immune, immunomodulatory profile we found that there was a dramatic enrichment of, um, of this immunomodulatory configuration in those who achieve um, PATH CR. Uh, looking at it more carefully on a computational basis, we wanted to ask, are there specific components of the immune response that might be linked to better response in triple negative breast cancer? And the one that um, was consistently came out was actually the M1 macrophage configuration that was statistically elevated in those who had past CR and those who didn't. Um, as you know, we wanted to ask the question that across a different tissue set, that is the ovarian cancer, uh, is do we still see the same? And the answer is yes, even though they did not achieve uh, the statistical significance threshold, it came awfully close. Uh, when we looked at TCGA um, and just simply asked uh, M1 high versus M1 low using an artificial cutoff, we find that it was it was only the BRCA1-2 wild type tumors that accrued a uh, the, a survival advantage, not seen in BRCA1 mutant or BRCA1 methylated uh, tumors. Thus, confirmed on both ovarian and breast cancers that there is an effect of M1 uh, gene expression within the tumors that is associated with better outcome. So um, to summarize this uh, element of the talk, uh, we found that, that BRCA1-2 disruptive mutations very clearly predict for enhanced sensitivity to platinum-specific based therapies, but BRCA1 uh, promoter methylation does not. The, uh, and what we have found, or a hypothesis going in, is that BRCA1-2 mutations produces a fixed BRCA deficiency configuration, whereas the promoter methylation uh, tumors will adapt after platinum treatment with increased levels of wild-type BRCA1 expression to become resistant to genotoxic agents like platinum. Furthermore, we found that the enrichment of the M1 immune gene set is associated with good outcome specifically for BRCA1-2 wild type tumors. Now, this suggests that, um, that the standard use of HRD scores, or homologous recombination deficiency scores, to predict chemotherapy response will be highly dependent on the proportion of cases of BRCA1 deficiency um, that is uh, through promoter methylation. The, the higher that fraction is, the less likely HRD scores will be predictive. The lower it is, um, the, the more likely it will be associated with, with predicting outcomes. And this may be one of the major reasons why HRD scores has such a checkered past. Um, this suggests that an alternative algorithm uh, taking into account these genomic-based components will outperform HRD for um, 
for, for, for as a theragnostic. So we developed a combined predictor response whereby uh, BRCA1, 2 mutated tumors are considered a good outcome, uh, however you define it for TMBC, which is past CR and ovarian cancer. Uh, but the wild type tumor can be fractionated out to those with M1 high with good outcome, M1 low with poor outcome. And the BRCA1 methylated is intermediate. Um, and when we applied this to our uh, City of Hope triple negative breast cancer cohort, we find that the HRD was a poor predictor of outcome with a low accuracy. The BRCA1-2 um, uh, mutant status um, was significantly better with a higher accuracy, but the best was our combined criteria um, that had a, um, that showed a dramatic segregation of outcome uh, if we define an individual as poor outcome, there's a 10% chance of a path CR versus a 85% chance of a path CR where we define it as a good outcome with a high accuracy. When we flip it over to um, ovarian cancer, I'm just giving you this one scenario of uh, TCGA, the HRD index was statistically um, a predictive, um, but, but was the, uh, the, the ability to predict was better with BRCA1-2 status and was actually the best with, com with the combined criteria. Best not necessarily in terms of the hazard ratio, but clearly in the number of individuals that we can port over to uh, the good outcome group. Um, when we look at the, um, the overall survival, HRD again shows a, an advantage but the BRCA1-2 status and the combined response criteria actually shows a subgroup of individuals that, um, that has a plateau in the survival curve, um, um, you know, suggesting that they may be cured with, with the chemotherapy, uh, with a platinum-based chemotherapy. So um, uh, what's the advantage of this approach? Well, at least for triple negative breast cancer, it may spare individuals from receiving uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, uh, which has been shown to have a, uh, to, to advance um, overall survival and path CRs, but is associated with a significant amount of uh, uh, immune related toxicity. But our observation that M1 high in the wild type um, BRCA1-2 wild type triple negative breast cancers is associated with past CR raises the question of whether or not these are individuals that might um, even respond to uh, better with, uh, with ICI as, um, uh, as opposed to the ICI non-responders in those without the M1 infiltration. So at this point, I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to show you this, this data. I would love to work with you and with SWAG um, and going forward in, in developing this theragnostic uh, in the context of clinical trials, especially once we can parse out individuals who do well and do well specifically with a particular chemotherapy agents, we can concentrate on those individuals who would by molecular and biological um, underpinnings would not do well with chemotherapy. I want to thank my colleagues, particularly Francesca May, who is a, a major sci um, scientist in my laboratory, Rolver Hock, who helped us with the computational uh, approaches, and um, a long-term collaboration with Ralph Scully and Beth Israel Medical Center in the basic science of this observation. Uh, and I've already acknowledged my clinical and research partners. At this point, I want to thank you so very much uh, for the time and your attention.